Okay, Elliot, so before we actually start the podcast and talk about things in the piece this week, we want to start off by talking about, you know, gambling and the relationship between the NHL and MGM Resorts. Uh, it's always nice when you force two people to stand there while you yell at them. In that <laughs> spirit, Elliot, the floor is yours. Well, I'm not going to yell at them, but, you know, you remember, Jeff, we both started in radio, and the best thing about radio was you could show up in your jammies, you didn't have to shave, and right. then somebody came up with the worst idea ever of putting radio on TV. Was Fabulous Sports Babe the first? Uh, I think Imus was. Done. I think Imus was. So then we start doing this podcast. And again, you know, you can show up. We can show up on our jammies. We don't have to shave or anything like yeah, that. That's right. And now the YouTubers are here, Drew and Kevin. They put the show on YouTube. And we this morning, I'm like, I'm rolling out of bed. I've been up till whatever doing the blog. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, okay, I could just roll out of bed and go to the show. But no, I have to shower. <laughs> I've got to shave. I've got to put on a good shirt. Drew and Kevin, I just wanted to say, you are the latest people who have ruined my life. So thank you very much. <laughs> Essentially, what Elliot is complaining about is hygiene. <laughs> That's right. And someone is forcing him to clean himself before he goes out in public. If I, if I have this right. Do you remember um, uh, the late Chris Farley had the great character on Saturday Night Live of the man who lived in the van down yes. by the river? Yes. I don't shower. <laughs> and he used to do the, like, the air quotes with that. Yeah. I, w I was actually thought of this while I, I, uh, that skit happened to come up as I was actually going around YouTube the other day, yep. and it reminded me of that. You know, the the phenomenon, though, of putting radio shows on television is a fascinating one. I did it with uh, Bill Waters when I was at AM640 on Leafs Lunch. John Shannon, by the way, that was his idea when he was running Leafs TV. I mean, we've seen it plenty of times. HC at noon now is, has uh, been a TV staple now for a number of years, a Sportsnet NHL network stateside as well. Um, and I always have this philosophical debate with various program directors, both radio and television side. I'm of the mind that when you do, when you simulcast a radio show, it should be a radio show that is simulcast on television, not a television show that's simulcast on radio. As such, you shouldn't have to do things like get dressed, like put on makeup. Like you should be able to just treat it. You need Wear to have Wizard that, of Oz costume. That voice. Well, that was really good today, by the way. That's <laughs> that become hilarious. a yearly staple for the, for the boys. Um, but I've always liked it when it's all the shots are over the shoulder. No one is talking to camera. You ignore the cameras. There's a keyhole element of it. Like the idea that you're looking at something you shouldn't be seeing. Whereas right now it's a combination radio show slash TV presentation. Essentially what I'm saying is that if I ran the zoo, it would be different. Yes, you know, I I liked, I always liked as a viewer watching something unpolished because so much of our stuff is polished. Hockey Night in Canada is very polished. Yep. I remember when McCowan's show first went on to radio, I wore a T-shirt once, and they said to me, not again. And you watch Hockey Central at noon, um, and it was a nice T-shirt, actually, but they still said not again. <laughs> uh, you watch Hockey Central at noon now. All of you guys, you have to wear jackets. Jackets and collars. So yeah. I, I do like the, like, there was a famous show, and, and people who listen in Chicago will know this show. They had the sports reporters on TV, yeah. and it was Rick Tallender and, and some guys who were old school Chicago guys. And I came across some tapes of this once after Sports Illustrated wrote, wrote about it, and they smoked. While they did the show, there was one guy really? who smoked cigars. Now, Greg Sansoni, he, and I think he was, I think he was joking when he said this. When we were working at the score, and initially we first started, and we were trying to get ratings up, Greg came up with the idea of we should smoke on television because people would definitely watch and say, "Wait a sec, those are the guys who smoke <laughs> on TV, like cigarettes or cigars, uh, whatever." Okay. I, I like a good cigar once in a while. So I, I do like the idea, Jeff, of, and the other day, like I saw Eric Smith's tweet when I was wearing the sunglasses and what were you yeah, wearing, yeah. The, whatever that day? And he's like, I don't even know the two of you guys anymore. Yeah, he's probably wearing a t-shirt. Yes. But, but, but people, people get shocked when they see ink on people that are on television. But That's right. Is. But I, I would like, I like, I would love to do one totally unpolished thing where, you know, maybe we could sit there. Like I would love to do one show once where, and I might get fired for this, but what the heck. Like, we open up a 2-4, and we start it, and we finish it, <laughs> and we see where the show goes. You know, there are other things that are legal in this country now that we could I, I don't know to. if Rogers is going to be ready for that. <laughs> but, uh, like, I, like, 
I, I like unpolished. I'm with you. Televisions. And because everything we do is so polished, I would like to do one that is so off the rails to see where it takes us. But that's like anything I, I find right now, right? What was the Leonard Cohen line? You know, uh, everything has a crack. That's how the light gets in. Like things that are too polished, I kind of get weird about. Like I want a little... I want a little Redness. dirt in it. Yeah. Like I want a little human in it. I want some mistakes. I don't want things to sound pitch perfect. Yeah, I'm with you. I've always found that, you know, when it's when it's too polished and too perfect, I, I kind of don't like it. But to the to the point about radio, yeah, I like the idea that this is these are radio shows that are on television. But as we do them now, to your point, hey, get the collars and the, the jackets on, guys. Those are decisions made by TV executives. Yeah. Like Dave Cadeau, who uh, is the PD at the fan, would be just fine with us showing up in, you know, dry fits and shorts mm -hmm. and flops and, okay, just go do the radio show. But it seems if now more so than ever, sports radio is being simulcast on television because it's cheap programming. Yeah. It's really, it's easy to shoot. Mm -hmm. It's cost effective and people watch. Like I remember when it first showed up, I'm like, wow, this is kind of neat. And I started doing Leafs Lunch with Waters and I'm like, well, this is going to be interesting to people for about five minutes because- We've been in the industry for a while. You think like, well, how interesting can it be seeing the inner workings of a, of a radio studio? It's not that exciting, but people dig it. People, people like that. They like to see how the sausage is made. Uh, I remember- Even if it's as boring as two guys staring at each other as they talk? You know, I remember when, when Yarmor Yager was, but another one, I remember when Yarmor Yager was acquired by the Rangers from Washington. His first game was in Ottawa, and I believe the Sanders killed them. It was like 9-1 to one or something like that. But it was a Hockey Night in Canada game. And after the game, they uh, Yager had agreed to talk to Ron by earpiece after right. the game. And even when they got killed, he still agreed to do it. And the camera showed our technicians as they wired him up and got, you know, put the IFB on him, put the microphone on him, the, the packs and all that. Yeah. I was looking at this thing. Who would want to watch this? Like, wh why are we showing this? I remember later that week, I ended up going for dinner with a couple of my buddies, and they said, you know what we really liked watching was you guys putting the stuff on Yager. Yeah. Because they just wanted to see how, it was interesting for them to see how it all worked. So I'm not, like, the more I've heard that, yeah. the less I'm surprised that this stuff works. It works in news, too. Moses Snymer was City TV News. City's uh, newsroom, in the, yeah. Uh, in the, that newsroom in the 80s. Um, I mean, that was revolutionary, finding it. So it's not just half man, half woman, half desk. This is, Walking you know, around. Yeah, this is, hey, Peter Gross at his desk delivering the sports. Here's Anne Murskowski wandering around uh, as she presents international news. And here's every car accident that happened today in Toronto. <laughs> if it bleeds, it leads, yes. you know, the uh, the lesson. Okay, uh, with that, we'll kick off the podcast, get to NHL and gambling here in a second. This is 31 Thoughts, the podcast, brought to you by the all-new 2018 GMC Sierra Denali. Elliot, Jeff, Scott Moore here. Thank you for the nice things you said about me, and there was no real reason to do that because I can no longer fire you, and that is the greatest disappointment of me leaving this job. And I wanted to set the record straight on something, Elliot. I absolutely have no recollection of meeting you as an 18-year-old, and actually, I have no recollection of you telling me the story of you meeting me as an 18-year-old, so clearly you didn't make an impression on me either way. And the person at CBC who told you that I was not a fan of yours was absolutely incorrect. I was a fan of yours coming into the CBC, and you've done nothing but show me why I should be an even bigger fan of yours. Now, I do remember meeting Jeff Merrick for the first time. It was at Dunn's Restaurant on King Street when Joel Darling and I offered him a job. So, Elliot, I'm afraid he is slightly more memorable than you. But look, you guys have done an outstanding job both on television, on radio, and also now in the new podcasting world. I'm really thrilled that we decided to put 31 Thoughts together as a podcast. I think it ended up being inspired casting to put you two together. And as I've said now several times, the only way I can find the time to listen to your incredibly long podcast was to quit my job. So... If you're looking for me, I'll be the guy with the earbuds in, chuckling at your 31 thoughts for the next few years. Cheers, boys. Moore is the best. Uh, that's our now former boss, Scott Moore. I remember that conversation, by the way, at Dunn's, like it was yesterday. It was stunning. It was just an informal, like, Scott just emailed me one day. and said, hey, you want to get together for breakfast? I had no idea what I was doing. Afternoon radio with a 640, local sports talk radio. And that was a conversation completely. I remember walking into Dunn's and I saw Scott. I go, what's Joel Darling doing there? 
And then all of a sudden it was like, we need to have a confidential discussion with you. And my life changed. Like that was it. That set me on this course. That one conversation at Dunn's and King, on King Street. Would you eat? I don't think I even ate because whenever I'm at meetings like that, I never choose to eat because I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to spill anything. I don't want to have anything in my teeth. I usually just have a coffee or a water or a juice. I never eat at meetings like that. Do you? Depends. I'll have like something healthy. I'll eat healthy like, like I norm healthier than I normally do. Yeah. I'd be afraid of drinking because I would spill all over my shirt or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I'll have like a salad or something like that. That's risky. Salads are tough, man. Well, as we have on it, but you can make a mess of yourself with a salad. A, a, a buddy of mine told me that um, he he saw a guy lose a job once because he ordered like the most ex expensive thing at a menu at a law clerk dinner. Because someone else was, was picking up the tab? Yeah, like the company said, we're taking you guys out for dinner. Yeah. And he went out and he took advantage. You know, he ordered like the most expensive steak, like the Kobe beef or something like that. And, They're, um, and it was see ya later. Anyway, yeah. hope Scott's there, enjoying there, Australia. There, there is a, a term for that, CLM, career limiting move. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah, best of luck um, in whatever capacity you fill next, Scott. Uh, as we mentioned in previous, we've always been consistent about this. This podcast isn't um, isn't on the air uh, without Scott Moore. So thank you for that. So he's essentially calling someone at CBC you had a conversation with a liar. There's a lot of liars in this business. <laughs> no, I, I don't. You know what? Uh, somebody did tell me that. I yeah. will say that. But uh, it's irrelevant now. It's ancient history. We move on. Thank goodness. We move on to talk about gambling. Yeah. Uh, MGM Resorts and the NHL. Uh, this deal, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the NHL has eyes for next, at the start of next season. Yes. So formalizing a relationship with MGM. And as you've pointed out um, in 31 Thoughts, uh, we talked about this on Monday's TV show. This is more about selling data than anything else. Now, let me just say, you can attest to this. You know, Doug and Berkey oh, man, were, were talking about, you know, you. all the all about the gambling stuff. And I said, this is all about the data. And the two of them were ripping me. They were like, oh, this is so exciting, Elliot. We can't <laughs> wait to hear you talk about it. In their defense, it was pretty hilarious. Yeah, it, no, it was as relentless. Someone, as, like, I, I laughed. Like, oh, it no, was no. good. They did not turn the tap off. They just kept <laughs> going. You thought they were, uh, they were summing up. They were still adding up, just no, going at you all night. They were relentless, the two of those guys. But to me, that's, that's what the story is about. And, and, you know, data rules the world. That's what, you know, Google is based on. That's what Yahoo is based on. That's what Facebook is based on. All those big media companies that basically control everything that we see, hear, and read, um, that's based on data. And that's what this is about. And at, at the bottom level, basically the National Hockey League has been, you know, they've fiddled around with some of this stuff. They did it at the All-Star Game in Columbus in 2015. They did it in the World Cup in 2016, and initially it was all about improving their broadcasts for the partners, and now it's about the gambling and, and how quickly they can get this information in real time. And, uh, you know, that's what, we're, that's what we're looking at here is that's what MGM and the other partners who eventually sign up with the NHL want, the hard data, because it allows them – to set proper lines and do it fast. Jeff, ideally what Rogers wants someday is that you're sitting at home mm -hmm. or you're out somewhere and you're watching a game on your phone or your iPad or your TV and Connor McDavid uh, has a penalty shot or he gets tripped. Prop and bet are time. they going to score on the power play? This is And then click how much do I want to bet? Click yes or no. And that's what they want. And the best way to set the odds and people will say, well, you can easily say yes, no, are they scoring on the power play? But what they want are the best way to set the odds, to determine mm -hmm. what your likelihood of success or failure is, how to set the lines, and the data allows them to do that. What type of information then is actually being sold? You and I had this conversation on Monday. Is it just player information? Um, is it just information on the ice? Is it injury information? What does that mean for injury disclosure and uh, something you and I discussed the other day. Does information about officials become part of it? You know, I, I meant to ask about that, and I will. I'm, I, you know, I didn't have a time to finish that this week, but I do know that teams keep books on officials. Like, they know, okay, our record is like this with this guy, um, or this guy tends to call a lot of this kind of penalties. Uh, most teams, from what I understand, keep a book on officials. So I don't know if that'll be public, 
but I think that the teams know that information. And I always assume if the teams know that information, there's somebody out there gambling who knows that information. Well, so yeah, too. if you're if you're setting the line, do you yes. not want to know like, okay, who's okay? Let's say you know Pittsburgh's power play is firing at 27, 28 percent. They're going into tonight's matchup against the bottom feeding team, and this is an official that calls a minimum of eight minor penalties per team. And you know it in the up. morning because it's on the game notes. You know, and you know, you NBA know who the, is different. You, you know who the know, official is. NBA, you don't know until they jog out in the court. Yeah. I wonder if that type of information is, is fed as you, as you set the line, like how relevant that becomes. Like, listen, I'm not trying to say, you and I have talked about before. No, I think it's very interesting. With the Flyers in the 70s with Art Scove and his record and Emil Francis of the Rangers was outraged when they put Art Scove's record uh, for the Philadelphia Flyers when Art was officiating and it was something like, you know, 42 and three or something like that. Scove got a standing ovation at the Spectrum. You know, Rangers players are like, what is going on? What is, I've never seen a referee get a standing ovation uh, but but there it was. Like I wonder if you're the one setting the line. Is that not completely relevant information for that game? Absolutely. And I would bet they know. I would bet the, they keep books on all these guys. And how would Stephen Walkham and the officials feel about that? What can you do? The, the horse is out of the barn. No, I I get that. But I mean, is that another layer of pressure for all the NHL officials? Because listen, there, everyone has a record, right? Okay, um, Wes McCauley, Here's your record uh, when the Pittsburgh Penguins play. Yeah. Here's your record when you're officiating a Buffalo Sabres game, a Los Angeles Kings Dallas Stars game. I, I think it's I think it's only pressure, Jeff, if you allow it to be pressure. You don't think any of those guys would be concerned about it? Well, I'm saying some of them might be. Yeah. But I bet you some of them aren't. What's the most curious thing for you for this entire MGM resorts, which is going to turn into, as you well, mentioned, like I'm curious about. I am curious about how they're going to do the player tracking. Like so, for example. Um, there's there's one company called Sport Vision that is now bought by another. It's now been bought. It's now owned by a company called SMT. But when they were Sport Vision, they did the All Star Game in Columbus and they did the uh, World Cup. And they are generally seen as the industry leader. They created the first and ten line in football. They run the pitch FX in baseball. Yeah. And they also Great I think stuff. wrote the hits code for the NHL.com website. And they've been – now, one thing I did hear was the league didn't like their puck at the World Cup. Like, they just didn't like it. They just felt – You know why? Did they well, say why? they didn't like the two-piece nature of it. I just heard they didn't like it. The way it was put together with the chip and everything, they just felt it was, quote-unquote, different. Structurally, was there integrity to it? Like, I, I just was like, oh, told – I was too hard and it'll, it'll smash? I was, well, that is one of Bettman's biggest fears. Like, he does, like – it's his job to think of what's the worst thing that can happen. Like, for example, a lot of people who know gambling a lot better than I do say that, you know, you, you, don't, you, you have to worry less than ever about NHL games getting fixed. If you look at all the things that get fixed now, like tennis matches and things like that, they're generally low-level, off-the-beaten-path tennis matches. Right. The biggest ones don't get fixed. And they say that, it's, there's too much attention on NHL games to fix them. But Bettman has to worry about that. That's always his question. But hang on, pause on that, because there's one position that can't affect it pretty quickly. What, a goalie or a referee or... Drop your glove three times, it's 3 nothing. pretty much game's over. Well, the thing is, the problem is, how much money are these guys making now? Like, it's harder to do that. Understood. Like, it's not impossible, Jeff, but it's harder. And that's what the gamblers say. Um, but anyway, but every time he has a meeting, Bettman's job is to go in there and saying... What happens if my game gets fixed because of this? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the same thing. Like with the puck, he has to go in there and he has to say, what happens if I'm in overtime in a game seven of a Stanley cup final and someone comes down the ice and blasts the puck and it splits in half and half the puck goes, goes in, in and half the puck goes into the corner. We've seen it before. That's his nightmare. He yeah. has to ask. That's his job to ask that question. So I heard he didn't like the puck and that's one of the things they've kind of struggled with. Now, I've heard that um, other companies have been invited to try to do the tracking, and it's not yet where it needs to be. And they're still, and right now they've got a company. And tra tracking what's happening on the ice. On the or, ice. Or, or, okay, I was going to say, because tracking player information. Player and puck. I'm talking about okay. player and puck. Now, right. initially last year, the league was trying to do something without chips. And we found out about that because they said they didn't necessarily need player approval to do it. 
because if you're not using chips, you don't need player approval. At least that was their position on the issue. Right. I heard that's gone away. And now I understand they are trying a a player and puck chip, chip system. And someone told me that the club team at UNLV is one of the groups of players that they're testing with this. And the, and the company they're using is a German company that runs a, a, a program called Jongmo, which transmits it by radio waves. And what I don't know, because nobody will tell me, mm-hmm. is if it's fast enough yet. Like, that's the thing you want. It's got to be fast. And SMT, from what I understand, they're supposed to be the fastest. But right now, the NHL is trying something else. I don't know the reason. People, uh, there might be a good reason. I don't sure. know. But right now, people aren't telling me what it is. Do we have a sense now of, or a, a vague estimation, I'm sure the NHL does, of how much money this is going to bring in? And just around this, this does count as uh, HR. Yes, it does so count So the players as do participate yes. in this. This affects, you know, how much they'll pay in escrow, how much uh, higher the cap goes. Do we have an idea of how much? Like, how much is this going to move the needle for the NHL and the players? Uh, you know, I heard not a lot at the beginning. You know, and the the other thing I want to find out about this is the term of the deal because I think that's an interesting one too. The NBA deal with MGM is three years, okay. and like the NHL deal, the NBA deal is non exclusive. So I think that the you know the the way they're going to move it is they'll sell it to different places, and then and also they will you know and if it's short term and it really works, mm-hmm. then when it's over, you can resell it to make it more money. So I heard in the intro in the beginning they're not expecting to make a big windfall. Where I think they're also hoping for this to make a big difference, Jeff, is the ESPN and or the NHL US TV rights are up in a couple of years. Right. It is believed that ESPN is going to be back in. Now maybe NBC maintains the major rights and ESPN gets a game of the week. There's all sorts of different rumors back there, but I think they're going to be different than we are here. I think there's going to be multiple rights holders. And what there's a study out there and I did ask a couple of people about this. What you're really hoping for in the NHL is what happens if in the next couple of years you can conclusively prove that as you gamble on games, there's more interest in them? That's a huge part of all and of this. That, See, par- and part of this, I think, as well, is that's what is about the media rights. Is the flypaper that this now provides yes. for fans. This is the sort of, uh, this has always been the argument about injury disclosure. Mm-hmm. The more information you have available for players in your sport, the more reason fans will get attached to it. The more you hide that, the more you try to shield away information, the less fly paper there is for people to attach themselves to your sport. Well, I I, I just don't, I have no, I don't believe injury reports. Like people say, oh, the NFL, they're so honest with their injury reports. It's total BS. Giselle Bunchen came out a couple of years ago and said that Tom Brady had a concussion. He was never on the injury report. So, I mean, it's all what you choose to believe. They're always going to hide it if they can. But Jeff, I, I do believe that is the key is, do the NHL media rights, especially in the States, because we can't do this yet, mm-hmm. become more valuable because of the engagement from gambling? And that, I think, is a huge bet, too. Interesting. Okay. Uh, we'll stay do you gamble, by the way? Are you a gambler? I'm not a gambler, but, you know, we were talking about this on Monday, too. I think if I'm watching on, you know, Rogers NHL Live, I'm watching like a Columbus-Minnesota game, and, you know, Wierenski gets hauled down and Columbus goes on a power plane and something pops up on my iPad and says, what do you want to put on this power play? I'd go, yeah, here's five bucks. Yeah, I, I would. Probably, I would do it in a flat. Like you like, gamble. I do like, pools. I, I do hockey pools. I do football pools. Yeah. Um, I don't really gamble on individual games, but I I could see myself doing it just for fun. I would do it. I think and I'm not I a think, gambler. My wife is going to have to hide the remote from me. There's there's no <laughs> there's no question about this, Steph. I'm uh, Steph. I'm sure Steph is glued to this podcast right now. Sure, so, so is mine. Like I have a buddy. I'm not this bad. I like to tell the story. I had a buddy. He was a smoker. And he quit smoking, and one of the ways he quit smoking was he picked up gambling. And uh, he told me that, so one night we go over to his house to play cards. Like, I love to play cards, but we just can't do it anymore. Anyway, he says, Elliot, who do you like tonight, the, the Rough Riders or the Stampeders? And I look at him and go, isn't it a, still in the, the exhibition season in the CFL? <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, but I got a bet. I was like, you are sad, man. Taking one problem and replaced <laughs> it with another. That's great. So. You come out, uh, come out the same. Uh, we'll follow that story. Um, I always find it interesting when you write about coaches. 
Okay. And one of the more interesting coaches to me, and we referenced him last week on the podcast, is Paul Maurice. Yep. Now, I got to initially know Paul a little bit when I was doing Color for the Marlies games on radio with John Bartlett. 2009, right? So, yeah, yeah. and Paul was Paul was the head coach. Yeah. Uh, so I got to, you know, ride bus with Paul and talk, you know, about hockey sitting up at the front. Uh, and then, of course, talk to him, you know, before and after, uh, before and after AHL games. I find him one of the more interesting guys. We mentioned last week, maybe the best deadpan in the entire NHL coaching fraternity, and he's a smart guy too. Um, and in your piece this week, he talks about coaching with the weight of expectation. Yeah. For probably the first time in his career. Like if you look at the successes of Paul Maurice, you think of course, Carolina Hurricanes, and those were teams and the one that may, almost made it all the way and ultimately flamed out against Detroit. Um, those are teams that had zero expectation. Is this the first time that Paul's really coaching where everyone's saying it's either you and the Preds coming out of the West? I asked him if if it was at all different in 2003 because they'd gone to the Stanley Cup final the year before and they lost to Detroit, and he said that team still had no expectations on it. Like, nobody believed in them. So this is very different. And I thought his answer was interesting because he said yes, but not – for the reasons I believed, it's because that he saw a team that was ran out of steam and was, you know, half a step slower against Vegas after winning the first two rounds. And what he feels as a coach is that you have to find that half a step. And it, when I thought about it later, I, I felt I shouldn't have been so surprised because that's a very coachy answer, right? Mm -hmm. You expect a coach to say something to you like that, to say, okay, all these things are good, but he, here's what I have to fix. It is interesting, though. Maurice, I looked it up 15 years ago. He was the most tenured coach in the National Hockey League. When he was what started the 2003-04 season with Carolina, mm -hmm. nobody had been a coach in the NHL longer than him. Now, here we are 15 years later. He was 36 then. He's 51 now, and he's third behind Joel Quenville and John Cooper. I, I think it's amazing. He's still a pretty young guy, and he looks pretty good at 51. Yeah. He's been doing this a long time. Yes. A long time. And I, I and I wonder, like, you know, I look at coaches now, and, you know, hey, Connie Mack, and I know I'm really hitting the generation Z well with this. <laughs> Connie Mack sat in a suit in the Philadelphia A's dugout for 50 years. Like, I can't imagine anybody coaching for 50 years anymore. I, I think the pressure on these guys is greater than ever. I think the amount of work they're expected to do is greater than ever. I, I don't know if anybody has worse worse work-life balance than, than many coaches I see in all different agree. sports. 100% um, you know, like, like, I wonder, if you're starting to coach now in this era, how many people are going to last 10 years? 15 years. Like I look at Quenville and I look at Belichick and I, and I look at these guys and uh, I can't believe they're able to do it. I get that. In the when, same spot. I get that when you walk away from the game or the game kicks you out, that you want to stay involved in some capacity yeah. and coaching is an obvious one for a lot of guys. But given what these guys go through and your work-life balance point is, is a great one because they're first to the rink and last to leave. Yeah and it's headaches, and you live and die every period, I don't know why you would choose it. Like, when you know your what your level of stress is going to be and how this is going to be so harmful for your health, mentally and physically, why you would choose it, and even now more so than ever. And, like, we're just getting out of October and transitioning into November now, and let's just think back to, you know, the first three, four weeks of the season. We've had healthy scratches to players like Kevin Shattenkirk and Carl Alsner. Yeah. Like, High profile, Jay Bomeister, veteran guys getting scratched. There's no, oh, he's a vet, he's going to ease into the season. It's get to the playoffs starting in October, where every game means a ton. Like, there's no, oh, we're going we're gonna to hit our stride sometime after Christmas. There's none of that. Like, you start with a sprint. And that's why you see things, I think, like high impact veteran players getting scratched because there's no waiting for this guy to settle in, to, to ease into the season anymore. When you're a head coach, every single game means a ton, more so than ever. That's why these guys are getting scratched. There, there's nothing I hate reporting on more than coaches in trouble. Because, you know, their lives are already... Like, I, I generally I hate reporting a lot on things like that affect people's lives, right? You know, trade rumors. But for some reason, coaches being in trouble, they drive me crazier than anything else. And, like, you know, we, we know what's going on out there. Last year... 
I had heard that, you know, Jeff Blaschel was close and, you know, Ken Holland denied it and he backed up his talk. Um, but I felt terrible after I mentioned it. And even, even this week, last couple of weeks, you know, Nick's more been talking about Mike Yo and John Stevens, but we all know it's there. You know, I, I hate mentioning like, Hey, there's a lamb And today in the blog, I mentioned Sheldon Keefe. And it's just because I feel like you're almost being like a vulture. You're, you're, you're yeah. picking at the carcass, but it's news and you have to do it. But it, it really is the thing that I like the least is discussing people's future. What's going to happen with Dave Haxtell? <laughs> you know, I, sorry, I just had to jump in there with that. I, I knew what you were doing. I, did you watch their game last night? I did. You know, I, I felt, you know, the Anaheim guys, you could just see the sag. That's yeah. a really proud team too. Like the, I've always, I've always liked the Ducks. You know, I, yeah. I, I like the fact that they're tough. I, I like the pride that they have in themselves. I like teams that can play it any way you want it. Yeah. And that's why I like Winnipeg. And that's why I've liked Anaheim. But you, you could see last night that when that, when that Philadelphia oh, goal went in after they just tied it, like they were so ecstatic to tie it. Yeah. And that goal went in. You could just see the sag on their bench. It's, it's tough, man. That's a proud team. Um, I do want to get to Philadelphia though. Uh, yeah. Let's just do it now. Where, uh, where's everybody at with Philadelphia right now? You know, Ron Hextall went to bat for his coach as everybody in Philadelphia was screaming for his head last season, stuck with it. And I admired that. I admired the way both those guys handled it. hundred percent. And Hextall unflappable. Yeah. Just go forward, head down, do the work, game in, game out. You have to appreciate and, and respect that. Where's Philly at right now? Because fans are hot. You know, you know, Again. Hextall obviously he comes out last week and and he makes his comment that we've got to do something soon. And in terms of we got to win or something is changing. And you know what that says to me, Jeff? It's that last year his message was I'm backing my guy, and this year it's different. And when you're a general manager, you know that when things go badly. You can hold off the enemies at the gates for a while. Mm -hmm. But after, they're either going to start seeping through or you have to make a concession that you don't want to make to stop that from seeping through. And to me, that availability last week from Ron Hextall was him saying, you know, I've held back whoever in the organization wants change for a while. Yeah. I can't, keep I'm beginning doing it. to lose that battle or I might not be able to do that for much longer. My elbow's starting to bend. My elbow, like it's like <laughs> Donald duck. All the holes are coming through the dike. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if it's the coach. I don't know if it's a move, but to me, he's saying that I can't hold this off much longer now the interesting thing about this is they haven't been a team that's been mentioned a lot with Nylander but they could do it like I could they have pieces that I think Toronto could like mm -hmm. so who have we mentioned we've mentioned if Toronto gets to this point we've mentioned Los Angeles we've mentioned Minnesota Carolina. we've Carolina definitely they're all over the place there but I really do believe that if the, a stealth team that has what Toronto would want would be the Flyers. If you were a coach and you were offered a position with a team, what would your first question be back to the general manager? My, my first question would be, I, actually, I, I my, does my, my first, if I was a, my first question would be is one of the one of the great things I was told was if you if you have a are in a position where you don't have to take a job where you can take a job because yeah. some people have to take a job because their sure. leverage isn't that great and some people can take a job and your first question should be why how can you convince me that this team can win and I'm not, he says I'm not talking about the roster I'm talking about ownership the way you do business does your owner back you? Not only does he back you, does he back you financially or does he or she back you emotionally? Mm -hmm. Are they in your corner? Do they get off, do they hop off the bus first? How are they after three losses in a row? Do they, are they calling the dressing room all the time? Like that is what, what one guy who I know had a choice of job says to me is I pick the, the one time that I had a choice of jobs, I picked the owner. I research the owner because the owner 
is sets the tone for your entire organization. And if that person is stable and runs a good business, you can win. If that person is not stable and runs a bad business, you can't win. And so that's what I would say. I would ask questions about the owner. See, you're more thoughtful than I am because my answer would be, who's the goalie? Well, I think that's, to me, that's an obvious question. Like, I, I, like if I'm going into a job interview with you and you're interviewing me for a job, and, and by the way, you could never hire anybody better than me, I would just like to say. Oh, that. is that right? Yeah, eh? yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you're the GM and I'm the coach, I know about your roster I know what you what your power play was last year. I know what your penalty kill was last year. I know the way you played. I know your systems. I know your rotations. I know all that stuff. What I don't know, and I've only heard secondhand, is what happened behind the team. I want to know, is your owner going to be calling me? Is the, is the owner, if I take this job, yeah. is he going to be calling me every day? The first time we lose two games in a row, is, is he or she going to be like, this sucks? That, to me, is the big question. I joke about the guy that goes to the job interview and the interviewer says, uh, what's your worst quality? He says, my worst quality is that I'm too honest. I can't lie. It's impossible. And the interviewer says, well, I don't think that's a bad quality. I think that's kind of admirable. And the guy says, I really don't care what you think. <laughs> um, is, and, at that and, point, and, either it's really working or it's really not. <laughs> um, the reason I say goaltender is you look at the history of the Jack Adams yep. coach of the year and you draw the straight line between the coach oh, and the yeah, goalie. For sure. Like just, I know guys, the teams that have gone on PDO benders and all of a sudden, you know, it's Jack Adams trophy. It, it, it does happen, but I don't know if there's any position in hockey more tightly related to the coach than the goaltender. Alain Vigneault has a line. If your goaler is better than yeah. my goaler, you win. If my goaler is better than your goaler, I win. It's true. It's totally true. I love the used goaler, by the way. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm not mocking You're talking, his French Canadian accent. No, Cliff Fletcher is still the only one that I know personally that calls still calls them goalers <laughs> consistently. Whenever I talked to Cliff Fletcher and you mentioned anything about goaltenders, oh yeah, he's a he's a good goaler. Um, we worked at Calgary Flames uh, not too long yeah. ago, Calgary Fl Monday, and they've won back to back games as we record this podcast, uh, beating the Toronto Maple Leafs, beating the Buffalo Sabers, um, and you brought up the point that. Calgary's at a place now where they need things to settle yep. with their lines yep. that Bill Peters needs to, is is up very much of the mind that we need to settle what our lines are going to be and just leave them alone for a while. Mm -hmm. Where else is Calgary at these days? Well, I think they had a pretty honest discussion about, you know, one of the, one of the players had told me that, that have you noticed that more teams this year are playing man to man in their own zone? Have you noticed that? You're starting to see more of it. We, once upon a time, Colorado, we talked about this with Ryan O'Reilly last week. Colorado yeah. did it for half a season yeah. as a freak, but you are seeing it more. Well, I, the I think risk is when you lose your assignment, yes. you're deadsville. There's there's a bit of hybridness to it. I think I think there's a mix of it. But, you know, I was starting to see, uh, I thought I, I saw Calgary trying to play it. And I asked what it allows you to do is set casual picks. Yes. And, you know, but the thing is, one of the players said to me was, Believe me, we didn't lose to Pittsburgh because we we're playing man to man. We lost to Pittsburgh because we we're a bunch of morons against the rush. <laughs> and they, they talked a lot about that is, you know, just being less dumb, I think, or less stupid. I can't remember what I wrote on it in front of me is what he said to me um, when they were playing, when, when they were playing against the rush. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I think the Smith Riddick thing is interesting. You know, Riddick last year was really good, and then when Smith got hurt, he struggled with the load, but he's been very good for them this year. They had a bunch of guys that were dinged up for that stretch, too, yes. and a lot of guys had thrown in the towel. Uh, I I just think that, you know, Calgary's made a lot of changes. They need to just get guys get used to each other. Now, I thought it was really interesting that Freleek got bumped up to the second line on a Monday in Toronto, and I thought he was pretty good. And he played over 15 minutes. And then the next night in Buffalo, he played, I think, eight. So, you know, he's the guy who's – in the beginning of the year, it was Sam Bennett, mm. who was the guy Bill Peters didn't seem to have a lot of time for. That's changed. And now it's for leaks. So we'll see where that goes. But, you know, the one thing about Calgary is they went to China, which was a crazy trip because of between the typhoon that was there mm -hmm. and the travel and the fact that a lot of the gear didn't – had customs problems – then you come back, they, they, it really affected them. And they have a weird schedule this year. They've already had two two-game Eastern road trips. Yeah. If they get through this, and right now they're in first place, so they've played a couple more games than everybody else, 
If they get through this, I think they're going to be okay. I, I refuse to believe that this team is as bad as it's shown at some points early in the year. I think on paper, they're pretty good. Just one of those goalies has to hold. Brian Burke brings up the point and did so again on Monday when we did the Flames-Leafs game that the problem with the Calgary Flames is they're breaking in three young defensemen. Yes. And that's tough. You can break in one, mm, stretch it at two, but when you have three, and he does throw Noah Hannafin into that equation with Rasmus Anderson and Valimaki. Valimaki, it's challenging yep. when, you, when you have that many in that key position to do. I think that's very fair. I think it's, I mean... How many times has a team won with three rookie defensemen? Uh, seldom, if ever. Yeah. I can remember the San Francisco 49ers winning with three rookie defensive backs, but that's about the closest thing. I remember when the Toronto Beliefs broke in three rookie defensemen. That was defensemen. the year they went to the Eastern Conference Final, right? That was uh, Caberlet, Markov, and Trombley. And Yannick Trombley, yeah. Were the three, but everyone looked at that and said, ooh, good luck with that one. Yeah. That's what Calgary's kind of doing. Yes. Where are you at on Hannafin? Love the foot speed. You know, can I recover because of his, the foot I speed. Can we're cover on TV up mistakes. now, so they could see that. Um, you know, I here's the thing about Hannafin. Everybody recognizes he's going to play 15 years because he has all the tools. Yep. I think that him and Carolina, they were ready to divorce at the end. The Hurricanes were disappointed, and he was disappointed in them. You know, now you come to Canada. You can hide a bit in Carolina. You can't hide in Canada. Um, I I just thought we, you know, like sometimes I think we we don't hear a lot about guys and we mistake that for they're not that good. I don't think that's the case with him. I think he is a good player. But I just expect more there. Is that because you see the size and the foot speed and you say to yourself, wow, this guy, there's so many tools. I know he doesn't have a cannon from the point, but you look at the physical skill set, you look at what he can do with his feet, and you say to yourself, I'm expecting some offensive production with this. I don't even think it's offensive production. Like, not everybody, you can make a good first pass and not get a lot of points. You can still be a really good player that way. Um, but I just think that there's there's more there. Like, I, the Carolina, people who talked to me about him in Carolina said that that's exactly what it was. Like, maybe we're making a mistake because we see him as the fifth overall pick and we expect the fifth overall pick to be greater than he is. Maybe, you know, you look at Wierenski and, and, and uh, Provorov, Provorov were drafted behind him and you're saying he should be at their level. But I just get the sense. Someone had a really good saying to me about Jonas Brodin out of Minnesota. Mm. They said that Jonas Brodin is the kind of guy who could play 20 years in the National Hockey League, and you'd say, wow, he played 20 years, but you still think there should be more there. That's kind of the way I think about Hannafin right now. He could play 20 years in the league because he's so skilled, but I just want to see more. He doesn't have to go and pound people through the boards. He doesn't have to have the 20 goals a year, but it's just less good stuff happens on the ice when he's out there, and I thought it would, but it's still early. Uh, other Alfred. Lindholm has really been something. And by the he's way, been, he's been Johnny, excellent. Johnny Goudreau, next level, has right been now. incredible. He, he's been their best player. But you're right about uh, Elias Lindholm. He's come in to the Calgary Flames organization. Uh, he does play center. They have him play in the wing. Peters used him in the middle plenty um, with the Carolina Hurricanes. And if you look at all the, you know, Zarnik comes in, and Ryan we mentioned uh, Hannafin comes in as well. There's a lot of turnover in that Calgary Flames squad. To me, the best player out of all of True Living's deals, Elias Lindholm. He's been great. He's been great for the team. And James Neal isn't James Neal yet. Is that because James Neal is not in the James Neal spot? It could be. I, I you know, but it's it's sort of like the chicken or the egg. Part of the reason is that he's not playing up high. But secondly, you're not putting him on that first line right now the way it's going. But he just seems quiet. Like James Neal, when James Neal is really good. He's a pain in the ass. He really annoys you. I haven't noticed a lot of pain in the assness yet from him. You know, it just, yeah. I, I wonder, like part of me wonders if this is a guy who really thought he was going to be in Vegas long term and is still surprised he isn't. Hmm. And he's getting over the shock and disappointment of that. But, but he isn't James Neal yet. Much like Yessi Pogliarvi is not Yessi Pogliarvi 
yet, mm-hmm. but we don't know what that's going to be. We right. do know he's been scratched a bunch for games specifically. The other Alberta team, where are you at on Edmondson right now? You know, I think that the best thing, I mean, the best thing that happened to him last week was Dry Seidel got going. I mean, McDavid is spectacular. He'll carry that team on his back. But in the first couple of weeks of the season, they hadn't scored a goal when Dreisaitl was on the ice and McDavid wasn't. I think they were outscored four to nothing. And I think they were, you know, and then I think in the first, I think overall in the before the Pittsburgh game last Tuesday, they were outscored six to one when he was on the ice without McDavid. And and now last week, I think it was six to one with him on the ice without McDavid. As good as McDavid is, and he's phenomenal, they won't be successful unless Dreisaitl is a driver too. Right. And last week, he was a driver. He was a big-time driver. And that, to me, was the best thing that happened to them, was Dreisaitl found himself. And finish up, one of your thoughts on one team and one player. We worked the Minnesota-Vancouver game together on Monday. Your thoughts on Elias Pettersson and your thoughts on the Minnesota Wild. Going into that game against Vancouver on a five-game rip. Uh, lost that game and then came back and, and beat Edmonton two nights later. But where are you at on the wild? Yeah, Dubnik's been phenomenal. Like, we've been talking about John Gibson. We, we've we kind of left out Dubnik, who had a great start to the year until he got tuned that night in Vancouver, was a 945 save percentage. And I think, you know, I start making a list of guys who are Masterton guys. Mm-hmm. What about Ryan Suter? Like, yeah. when he got hurt last year, there were people in Minnesota who told me they thought his career might be over. Hmm. And not only is he back at the beginning of the year, he's playing fantastic. Now, he got turned by McDavid last night, but that's going to be like a badge of honor. Like, that's going to happen everybody to everybody. To, he shows – McDavid forces more nameplates to appear than anybody else. Monday night, we showed a board, though, Doug, of all the wild who were 30 and over. Like, I didn't even realize it. Like – now, what's so they've got to find an injection of youth, and I think Paul Fenton is looking. But, you know, they have a, a, a pick, Kirill Kaprizov in Russia, is in the KHL. He signed a three year deal before last season. And the Wild realized that they didn't do a good job of opening up a relationship with him and recruiting him. And Chuck Fletcher went overseas last year, met him face to face, and said, We want you here. Now, Chuck Fletcher's obviously gone. I think Fenton is going to do the same thing. But I heard a rumor in the summer that the owner, Craig Leopold, was going to go over to Russia to meet him. So Kaprizov signed a three-year deal. He's got one year left after this year, and they want him here after that. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard Leopold was going to go over. Now, he had hip surgery. I don't think he's going to be able to go. But I thought that would have been a fascinating story if the owner was going there. They need some youth. Yeah, and in a league that's trending young, you know he's going to be a big player for them if they can get him over in two years. Jordan Greenway, um, yeah, he Joel looked, Erickson, Eck, yep. I know they're looking for more production out of Luke Cunnan uh, as well. Um, quickly uh, on our way to break, Elias Pettersson was fantastic against Minnesota on uh, on Monday night, and this kid shows zero signs of slowing down, and this is coming off of a concussion. Well, I think that's the number one thing you like is that he didn't look afraid, blocking shots. Yeah. Although Berkey didn't like where he was blocking them from, right? Although he's, 15 he's feet a, in front of the one that wanted to get the Sedins away from the yeah. pucks too he, when he was there. Yeah, so I looked it up. He's shooting like 44%. The first guy we looked at this year was Matthews. It's yeah. come back down a bit. He's shooting 44%. The best rookie shooting percentage in NHL history are two guys who play with Mario Lemieux. Warren Young. Oh, yeah. 30.5%. End up getting paid from the Red Wings. Yeah. Thank you, Mario. Rob Brown, 30%. Right. So this guy, and he probably won't stay at 45%, but he's doing that early without Mary Lemieux passing to him. But it was just amazing. Yeah. You know, the Lemieux effect still there. You know, 30 years later, those guys still have the records. Fascinating. All right, uh, hit a break. Uh, more 31 Thoughts, the podcast, in moments. Welcome back to 31 Thoughts, the podcast. America's alongside Elliot Friedman, and please be joined now by someone who just celebrated his 1,000th game in the NHL against the Montreal Canadiens in Montreal, uh, Jason Spezza of the Dallas Stars. By the way, did you know, first of all, congrats. Second, did you know that Montreal was going to do that pause for you? Uh, no, not at all. I was completely shocked and uh, almost a little overwhelmed. I was. Uh, it's a pretty big honor to be recognized in a city like that, and a city where I played lots of games, and I'm pretty thankful that the Canadian organization did that. That's something I'll always remember. 
Critical flexion. I mean, I know that when players talk amongst players, how many games did you play is yeah. a big one. What did 1,000 mean to you? Yeah, it's, it is an important milestone because it shows longevity and you commit yourself to the game. So I feel like it's not something you come into the league thinking about, but as you get going, um, it definitely becomes a bit of a goal. And especially I had some health issues through the mid part of my career. Uh, where you know it seemed like it was a long ways off. So to be healthy now for a few years in a row and to uh, feel good, I think it's uh, something I'm very proud of. You know, Jason, you were in the spotlight from you were 15 years old. You know, every every hockey fan in the country kind of was made aware of your name, and we can never write our futures and our stories. But I, I know this is a really broad question, but when you go back to 15 and you think of how your career and your life went, how close? did it come to what you imagined or hoped it would be? Yeah, it's a tough question, but um, I'm happy with uh, my career and I've been able to establish a family while playing in the league and um, I would like to have won by now, but I still got a few more years to try to do that. We knocked on the door a few times. That's the one regret that you have or one thing that I'm still chasing is winning the Stanley Cup. That's what we play for. But um, as far as, you know, personal success and being able to play a thousand games and just being able to be in the league and be as productive as I've been I think that's all you can ask for um, that way but I I think that uh, you never know what you're going to be when you're 50 and there's all the hype and you, you just kind of take it day by day and you don't really look too far ahead in the future so uh, I think it's gone all right take take us back then to, to 15 year old Jason Spets the first time I saw you were playing on Stan Butler's Brampton squad Rafi Torres on that team as well and um, I remember, like to Elliot, Elliot's point, I mean, everybody knows the name Jason Spezza early. What were your expectations of hockey? And at what point did it become legitimate that, hey, you know what, I've got a shot at making hockey more than just something I do to goof around with my buddies? Yeah, uh, I love the game. I've loved it since I was a kid. Like, it doesn't feel like work for me to go to the rink even now. I li- I, I think part of the beauty of it is like all the emotions that go with it so I think I've never had a hard time with that so as a 15 year old I think I just wanted to get better and I've I've always just you're always looking to improve and I felt like I could be an elite player in the NHL and at that age you think at you what be age the best. at what age did you think like hey I got a shot at this well I, I'd say when I was 13 I started to kind of be a little bit better than everybody and at 14 was a huge year for me I went to school at St. Mike's practiced every morning by myself my dad would drop me off at the rink and he was uh, working downtown so we'd drive uh from mississauga and he'd drop me off early for school i'd skate i'd go play on the school team and then i'd go play again at night for toronto marley's so i played hockey that year all the time and i just felt like my game went to another level and just um that's when i really felt like okay i can do something here for the first time, we have something in common because nowhere in that did you mention you went to class. Yeah. So you, know, <laughs> yeah. you and I are very yeah. similar in, in that kind of way. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, Jason, because you always, you talked about something that I really do believe separates the good from the great. And that is that you love hockey. And I know that, you know, you've got four daughters at home, so I know you're running around a lot, but you like to watch it. So if you could sit down one night and watch any two teams play in the National Hockey League, which two teams would you pick? Ooh, it's a tough question. Uh, well, I, I like watching Pittsburgh because uh, Sid is someone I have a lot of respect for uh, and the way he plays the game. But Gino is a guy that I really like watching because he's kind of a big, rangy guy, and I can kind of take stuff from his game and try to put it into my game. And then McDavid is just electrifying. Like, if he's on TV, I want to see what he's up to because he's – pulling you out of your seat whether you're a player or not and he's he's special so um those are probably the teams that you know i'd i'd like to watch the most i don't think too many people would yeah. argue with that pick do you no, connor connor's pretty good he turns defenseman pretty quickly it's, i remember that that first scary. game against <laughs> st louis mm-hmm. uh his first nhl game and he's going down against bomey jay bomeister and bomeister turns like bomeister doesn't show his nameplate to anybody no, and no, first yeah. game he's showing it to connor yeah. mcdavid no he's special there's he's got another gear that nobody else has you talk about loving the game, and I'm always fascinated with um, people that talk about hating things they love, and I think it's a healthy thing. Um, one of the, the great things about enjoying sports is also hating it, finding things you don't like about it. Um, have there been times in your career where you've hated this thing you loved? Oh, for sure. I don't know if I've hated the game, but I've hated where I'm at in the game. Um, you get down on where your performance is. You get down on how your team's doing. 
uh, you get down on some of the relationships that are, are happening and uh, the emotions that go with it. And um, that's where you have to really pick yourself up and find your way out of it. And I, everyone's going to have peaks and valleys. And it's, it's just a matter of riding your highs and limiting your, your downtime because nobody's immune to it. There's no, there's no player in the world that will go through not having a, a slump or a downtime or when your confidence is down. And to me, I think the important thing you learn is that you just have to limit when you're down and figure out a little bit of a, a road a roadmap out of it and how to get yourself out of your slumps and out of your bad times. So let me ask, because I remember one of those times I know you really battled was the 2007 Stanley Cup final against yeah. Anaheim. Uh, John Paddock was the assistant coach then, and he mentioned that after the first two games in Anaheim, you asked for every shift that you took against the Anaheim guys because you wanted to see again what yeah. was going on. So how do you, when you look at that, like how do you go about saying, I'm going to work my way out of this? For me, I, I turned to video a lot, even back then. Um, when Now it's easy to grab your shifts. Back then, the, the video coach would have to make CDs for you and like really work to get your shifts out. But I've always turned to video because like, I'm a visual learner. I like to see myself and what I'm doing. And then I have kind of a series of drills that I do in practice. I spend a lot of time after practice working on little things. And I just try to, I think you start putting the work before the, the skill and then your skill kind of comes out. So for me, I usually start by watching the games and figuring out what I'm doing wrong. And a lot of times for me, it's I stop moving. And when I stop moving, I'm not as effective. So um, that's something that I've learned over the years and just try to get myself out of as quick. And then you have to follow it up with drills and follow it up with habits to to kind of get things going. When you're rolling, you're rolling. You're doing everything right. You're, you're, you're reading the plays, you're skating to the puck, you're doing things good. But uh, when you're not, you have to identify what you're doing wrong. The 2007 final was, uh, was a fascinating one. Ottawa Senators, Anaheim Ducks. And I can recall saying to myself when it was all done and Anaheim wins, I said, you know, I really wish that Ottawa didn't have that big layoff. I mean, you guys yeah. were rolling. Like, I still maintain that in this era, that is one of, if not maybe the best team that didn't win the Stanley Cup. And I'm sure you guys felt it, like how good you guys were. When you look back on that 2007 team and that Stanley Cup final, always reaching for answers, what happened, ifs and buts, what goes through your mind, Jason? Yeah, no, there's, there's no doubt that layoff did hurt us. And you think there'd be an advantage to getting, making quick work of everybody, but it actually was a disadvantage for us. So that, that is a, like that is something that was legitimate. Um, but we lost in five games and the first two games we had five on threes with a one goal lead. We have like the games were really close. We probably should have won one for sure, if not maybe both. And then you come home, you feel the pressure. We win game three and game four, we just drop an egg and don't play very good. And then you're really got your backs against the wall. And we were a, yo like a younger team to be in the finals. And I don't think we handled game five very well just going into it. Uh, that's maybe my regret is that maybe we weren't, we didn't have the, the calmness to approach it that we just got to chip away at it. Like it, it was, it was a long trip back to Anaheim. It was, sure. we got off to a bad start in the game and it was, it was a difficult game for us. And I look back and regret that that game wasn't more competitive because you couldn't do anything about the games before we missed our chances, but that game five was not, not how we should have been. What went through your mind when you saw Alfredson take the shot at Niedermeyer? You know, I was, I, it was so funny. I was going <laughs> to ask him, flash I was, yeah. was going to say, I was, my, my question was going to be, he did it on purpose, didn't he? <laughs> you have to ask him. <laughs> so funny that we yeah. thought of the exact same thing. It was such a flashpoint yeah. moment in the series, and so uncharacteristic. I mean, you're talking about not being, you know, yeah. being unflappable and you know, on point and focused. And here's, of all people, Daniel Alfredson who yeah. tees one up at Niedermeyer. Oh, he had an edge to him. I think, yeah, Alfie's a very competitive guy, and I think it was probably a little bit of a desperation. Let's try to rally the troops, change things a little bit. Um, and yeah, definitely two like the gentlemen of the game, Scotty Niedermeyer and Daniel Alfredson. So uh, probably a, a moment that goes down in history a little bit. You know, I wanted uh, Jason, when you're here to talk about Jason Spezza, the person, because I, I really believe as great a player as you are and what you've accomplished, making it a thousand games in the NHL with more to come. I really do believe that there are things that you have done off the ice that are incredible. Um, for example, when Sam Bennett, couldn't do the pull-ups, I guess it was, at the Combine. It was you who sent him a note and said, you know, don't worry, I didn't have a great Combine either, <clears throat> and it didn't affect me. I thought that was a really great thing you did. And one of the things I remember one night in a hockey night is we go, we go in to do a game in Ottawa on a Saturday night, and on the Friday, Jeff, there was a Baton Rouge uh, not far from the rink, and we went there for dinner, 
and you were sitting there with Brian McGratton and the late Ray Emery. And that is when I first heard about um, what you helped those two guys through. And can you take us through your friendship with both of them and why you felt it was important that you help them battle their demons? Yeah, um, they're both very close friends of mine. We were really close. We lived together for a long period of time. And uh, both guys went through substance abuse issues. And um, I always tried to be someone they could talk to. And, um, you know, even Gratz to this day is the model for how to handle yourself through rehab and through uh living your life the way that he has you know since his issues so for me I, I think that um the game has given me so much and not in particular to brian and and razor but it's important that you kind of give back to the guys you're playing with too and i think that i've been very fortunate to have all these experiences and now that i've been around for a long time but the relationships are kind of what makes this so special like you, you're gonna miss the game when you're done you talk to guys the, the competition you miss but you really miss the the, the guys and you really miss the ups and downs and going through it together and I think that you can really help people along because a few words of encouragement here and there can help get someone out of a funk and um, that's kind of how I try to operate because I know that I can get down sometimes too when somebody tries to pick you up it helps and everybody else goes through the same thing so I think it's your almost your moral ob obligation to try to pick people up along the way to just to create a better environment for your friends your teammates your associates people you're around and I always assume that it's difficult when you see players like Emery, McGratton, who are friends, who are teammates, and you hear how people are talking about them, what they're saying about them, what they're writing about them, and you probably say to yourself, well, that's not right. Well, that, well that's wrong. Like, when you look yeah. back now, like, what did everybody get wrong about Ray Emery and Brian McGratton? What did you look at and say, whoa, 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 whoa. pull yeah. up, that's not, that's not right. Well, I think Ray was very misunderstood. I think Ray, Ray um, he was a flamboyant personality maybe before uh, the social media era of where everybody wants to be flamboyant now and where it's looked at as a positive. He was that guy just by being that guy. He just, he liked it and I think it made him tick a little bit and he, but he was such a loyal and well thought out, intelligent person and he got the reputation as being this hothead that didn't think about anything he did. Like Ray's a smart, smart man. Like he, he was a really sharp guy. Now that he's passed, it's amazing the outpour of people that talk to me about how he touched them, how great of a teammate he was. And people don't know that because people just think of the white Hummer crashing on the uh, highway, going to the, going to the plane. And they think of all the crazy stories they hear and him fighting Peters and laughing and Josh you know, in the you know, AHL. That yeah, was a good Josh one. Grad, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes the, the, the myth becomes bigger than the man a little bit. And, um, he's, he's a guy that when you strip it down, he was a phenomenal teammate. He was a phenomenal person and he had a huge heart and that's what you want him to be remembered by. And, and Gratz was the same thing. Gratz was like a big puppy dog. Like he's like this big tough guy that protected me my whole career. You know, when I played in the minors, it was a tough league during the lockout and nobody was allowed <laughs> going near me because Gratz would stare him down. And I think he fought like 47 times in one year, but he was like a big softy off the ice. Like we'd poke, we'd make fun of him. He's like the gentle giant. And on the ice, he's an absolute killer. So um, it's it's just you know you create a persona by playing because and some guys you need it to to survive to be a player. But the the people are a lot different usually than the players. One last one on this, I thought it was really a great thing that Ottawa did was waiting for you to get there to to do the Emory tribute video so you could see it when you played in Dallas. Are you doing okay? Like you know, have you? Yeah, it, it's, it okay? it, it's it's I'm very happy that the team recognized him because I think that uh, he needed to be recognized. I'm, I'm happy they waited for me to be there. Uh, it was a difficult couple days around it. There was a lot of situations around the, the days that made it uh, a little bit difficult for me. And to see the tribute was hard for me at the time. But I think it's all part of the, the grieving process, too. And I think it's helped. Um, but I'll always remember Razor. When I put my gear on, I... You know, it makes me think of him and, you know, the crazy smile he gets. And uh, he's a special guy that will never be forgotten by, by me and a lot of people. So um, it was very classy, the Sens organization. Outstanding. A um, little bit of bio information on me, Jason. Uh, my first ringside ever. This is about ever, Jeff, not you. This is about that's Jeff. right. But it, it does relate to Jason. I don't think you even know this. December 29th, uh, 2007, my first ringside assignment for Hockey Night in Canada. 
in Ottawa, your senator is facing off against the Washington Capitals. My first walk-off interview is Jason Spezza. Wow. I can remember standing next to him and I said, do you like doing these? Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. mind. <laughs> Some years later, I'm going to ask you the same question on mic this time. Yeah. Do you like doing walk-offs? Yeah, that, like they're all right. If you're playing good, they're all right. <laughs> if you just if score, it's six yeah. nothing, and if that's you got it, yeah. if you got two goals and they're giving you a towel and you're, you're talking about how good the team is playing, they're yeah. great. Um, they can be difficult. They they can definitely be difficult. But you do get the walk offs are probably unique because you get a little bit of raw emotion and you get the huffing and puffing after a shift sometimes. And you get I I think they're they can be kind of. The, the, the reason I ask is because I, I find it challenging to ask athletes about what they've just done because in a lot of ways, the game plays you and you just it's like this zen-like moment when you're out there on the ice and it's hard to right away, hey, Jason, what just happened? Oh, I don't really know. I yeah. was just playing. Like, do you find those? Well, you're never going to get much from a guy during a game, I think. Like, yeah. you're, you're still focused on the game. Usually, the like, the most introspective pieces you get are going to be on off days or on days when you have time to sit and think and talk and uh, when you're at the rink you're really focused and sometimes you know you just want to get through the interview and get to <laughs> get to the dressing room to get get the you know say something in the room or get yeah. to the next thing I saw so, that look a couple yeah. times yeah <laughs> yeah there's been, yeah how many hockey night towels are you up to now probably oh I Does don't know it? quite a few I got a I got a good stash in my in my house in Toronto and awesome. I got a few in Dallas and they're keepers for sure but I I was fortunate to be on hockey in Canada a lot playing in Ottawa so before you came today you had a film session with your new coach Jim Montgomery and you said he's pretty good like his yeah. film his film sessions are good yeah he's holding your attention like he is there's no preferential treatment to anybody in our locker room he's trying to he's trying to teach us from the ground up he's got a unique system and he wants us to play a certain way and he's holding your attention I've been I've been really impressed with the confidence that he's come in with and his ability to explain what he wants and I think that's been when a guy comes in with confidence I've you've seen that before um, but the way that he can portray his message and get it through to us and and explain himself has been really impressive I think he's got a great future like he you said he will point at a guy and say what are you doing here and what should you be doing here is that what he kind of yeah, does Yeah, exactly like yeah. he's he wants to know what you're thinking on the play he just mm -hmm. doesn't because sometimes the video you know it shows one thing but there's a thought process or there's a lack of communication there's something going on to cause a, the reaction by the players. So he, he's, he thinks very much like a player still, which is impressive because a, a lot of coaches don't see it that way, but he does see the game as a player still. Who is the worst explainer of what they're supposed to be doing? Oh, I don't know. That's a bad question. <laughs> you can't ask those questions. <laughs> I won't give you an answer to that. Don't worry, Jason. No one's listening. Off the mic, I can tell you. <laughs> what, uh, okay, another Montgomery question. What does Jim Montgomery expect of Jason Spezza? Uh, he expects me to produce and he expects me to be a good example in the dressing room. Um, he's pushed me again to get back to being uh, an every night contributor. I think last year was a difficult year for me. I don't think I had much of a role on the team and um, Monty came in and has pushed me to get my confidence back and to contribute every night again. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that was something I needed to hear. And I think that uh, it's engaged me again too. I think I feel... I feel like I can impact the games. I feel I feel great physically. I feel like um, I prepared really well for this season, and uh, to have a coach come in and he's pushed me. He's even nights where I've played what people think are pretty good. He's showing me clips that of things I can do better. Like he doesn't think hmm. he thinks I can do more than I'm doing, and I think I can too. And I'm happy with it because it's it's challenging me again. I was having a quest, uh, conversation last night here at Sportsnet with a couple of guys, and we were talking about who has the scariest shot in the NHL. And there was a lot of Shea Weber, Zidane Ochoa, this type. And I said, John Klingberg. And I said, John Klingberg, why? I said, because he's the only defenseman that's not shy about sailing it in high. How many conversations, we asked Tyler Sagan about this a while, how many conversations, if any, have you had with John Klingberg by saying, hey, you might want to put a leash on that puppy and kind of bring those down a yeah. little bit because he's not shy about lifting them up. No, it, it's... It's a fine line for him, I guess, a little bit, but he shoots little half wristers. So when deer taking those big clappers that are yeah. going high, that sometimes is a sky screen you can't react to. But he's got that little half snapshot, half wrister that sails yeah. high. So it's not as dangerous, <laughs> you know, as a guy that's like just he's looking, his head's up, he's looking. And a lot of times, I actually we've talked about how it can be a good shot because even if the guy tipping or screening misses it, it yep. the goalie doesn't pick it up. And Eric Carlson's been the best you know recently at it um 
before that was Nick Lidstrom was like the yep. the guy that all these guys are trying to copy. He had that little, you know, four feet up in the air wrister yep. that finds its way through sometimes. So I think that's what he's trying to accomplish. Yep. Uh, sometimes it gets away from him, <laughs> but hey, it's a game of errors. We all it gets away from all of us sometimes. And you changed yeah. your stick too, like you you, you did a couple yeah. Of years ago. Yeah. Well, I went through. Well, I used wood forever. Well, and, and then I went. And Brian through. Murray always used yeah. to fight with you about your curve. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because I used to have a big toe hook, and the with the old gauges, yeah. my stick was illegal because like how severe the curve was at the end. Mm -hmm. So me and Brian used to always argue about it, and <laughs> he told me he was going to fire my favorite train if I ever got caught. So now, hang, on, <laughs> yeah. hang on, hang on, hang to, on. To that point, did you have uh, first period, second period, third oh, yeah. period sticks when you played Back in Ottawa? Then, oh yeah, I had shaved down ones. I had, yeah, we I'm all not the using this in the third because that's when they're going to yeah. call a stick. Yeah, and I got called on an illegal stick. I remember that, Toronto, uh, you stepped on the and blade. And I tried to break it because I, I had that. done that in the American League and <laughs> broke it and I got a 10-minute misconduct instead of getting a two-minute penalty. So that's the story that's behind. smart. So Whoa, that's the story that's behind why, why I was trying to break my stick. Yeah. But I think the ref was Dan O'Halloran. I can't remember who the ref was, but it was a vet. It might have been Mark Jonetter. I I'm going to be wrong, but uh, it was a veteran ref that wouldn't, let me get away with it. So the video is like <laughs> me on the bench trying to break my stick. And but the reason why I was trying to break my stick and nobody knows is because in the American League, I had done the same thing and I got a 10 minute misconduct instead of a two minute minor. So I was trying to get a 10 minute misconduct That's for unsportsmanlike. Um, but now the gauges are different. The sticks are different. So you don't have to, it's not yeah. a hassle like it was. Nobody's sticks are illegal anymore. Last one for me. And that it's perfect off that. That's why you're going to be a GM someday, right? Yeah. Like you, you are going to go into management, I assume. I, I want to stay in the game for sure. I love it. Um, I don't know what I'd do without hockey. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think my wife thinks I'd go crazy if I stopped watching hockey. Um, so, yeah, I definitely have aspirations to stay in the game. And last one for me, we talked about this off air a little bit. You're a podcast guy. Yeah. Like you've come over to the podcast side of things. Yeah. What do you listen to? I'm sure fans would be interested. Yeah, uh, Joe Rogan, yep. pretty popular one. Uh, we were talking with Peter Atia, Ben yep. Greenfield, some of the fitness guys. Uh, yeah, just kind of starting to dabble into it a little bit, but I drive out to uh, the Frisco and practice, and yep. uh, sometimes I listen to some parenting stuff too to sure. to try to four daughters. help me out with four daughters. <laughs> yeah, yeah I got, all the help you can get. I, need, I appreciate yeah. it. Um, so yeah, so some of the TED talks are really good. Yep. Like so I find it's like a good way of educating yourself on something you don't know about. Sometimes right. it can be like a quick summary of. Something that maybe you're Will there ever be on? a Jason Spezza podcast? Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. You guys got it covered. Just tell you, I grew up with four yeah. sisters. Yeah. During that decade when they were all teenagers, my dad aged 46 years. So that's what you've <laughs> got to look forward to. Jason, it's been a pleasure. Continued success. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on the 1,000. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate Thank it. You, thanks for having me. All right, Elliot, to conclude, as always, hashtag Ask31. First one comes in from at Flying Dave. We sort of discuss this a little bit earlier. How will the recent sports betting and analytics deal affect the salary cap going into next year? Can we expect another $4 million increase? Oh, there's going to be that much sugar in the coffee, is there? Well, I wish, I have to double check this, but at the Board of Governors meeting in October, just before the season start, they gave uh, estimates on where they think the cap is going next year. And it was somewhere between, I think it was 81 and 85 million. Mm -hmm. um, I put it in one of my blogs a couple weeks ago. But that's kind of what they're looking at between zero and five percent. All right, uh, from at Inside Hockey BRC with Zach Hyman switching to the new visor. Yep. When is the right time to start the discussion of players switching to cages in junior slash pro for player safety? I mean, like in the NHL, they're going to wear a cage all the time. I don't think you'll ever see that ever. Actually, I shouldn't say ever because you... I've always figured that that's where this was headed eventually. No, now. I can't see it. Why? Because I, I, I just don't think guys will want to do it. Look how long it took to for visors to, to happen. Yeah, but they got there. They got there. And, you know, maybe, Jeff, eventually someday they will get there. But I just don't see... Like, those guys, they feel so much freer without the cages. Um you know, the jaw, I mean, a jaw injury is probably not as severe as an eye injury still is. still an injury. It's still, still an still injury. It still keeps you out. Hey, you want I, all your meals through a straw? Enjoy. Well, you know, if you read, you know, Travis Hamanek with missing teeth, he put the straw <laughs> through the hole and he was fine. Uh, you know, I, um, I, I, you know, I, I can't, I've never, look, put it, I've never heard this being a conversation. Mm -hmm. It would surprise me anytime soon. 
All right. Uh, Greg Neald was the first who was injured in junior to put on a, and construct a visor or wraparound uh, wrap. Um, was able to play in the WHA, but never the NHL because of the vision impairment. Brian Berard um, mm-hmm. uh, quashed that. So you could actually play with well, only one functioning eye. Who was the first NHLer to put on a visor? I want to say it was Borea Salming. I think he was the first one that I ever saw. Oh boy. I don't know. Somebody's going to know out there. Someone's going to know as soon as they hear this. And we'll tweet, tweet in the answer, please. Smarter than us. Um, from OG Simon. Will we be seeing an increase of international games, such as the one taking place in Finland? And where is the NHL planning next? I think, I think Chris mentioned this, that they're looking at going to Czech Republic next year. Okay. Um, you know, the commissioner said they want to do regular season games in China next year. Um, that's going to be a battle. I, I could see teams not wanting to do that because they say that trip is just so hard on your body and your rest. Um, well, is the issue that, A, the trip is hard and it's difficult, and then when you come back because you've been gone for so long, your schedule gets compressed to fit yes, games. it gets compressed, and also your body schedule gets completely screwed up. Yeah. Um, I believe fin- – no, they're in Finland now, so I think – che- yeah. Czech Republic is one on the radar for next year. I think you're still going to see one or two every year. And a follow-up. What, what I did hear, Jeff, is yep. that I hear there's more outdoor games coming. More outdoor games. Because they only, they only have two this year and none in Canada. Yeah. I think they might be ramping that up again soon. Uh, for, more, for warmer markets? I think they are looking at it. Yeah. I, I know they, they they are looking at it, and also I think they're trying to find different sites in Canada. Remember, last year we talked about the possibility of a game in Regina. Right. I, I think that's still somewhere on the radar. I was going to say, uh, somewhere out there, I mean, how many Field of Dreams games do they want? Build it and they will come, as opposed to just putting it where there's an NHL team. Mm-hmm. And Regina would sell. You bring the Oilers there, no problem. Uh, a follow-up question. Uh, this one from Trevor Roberts. Say, we got a lot of international questions this week. Maybe because the Panthers are... Because we are international superstars. Bingo! Trevor Roberts, uh, in that spirit, asked this one. Do you, think the, uh, do you think the NHL Global Series is achieving what it set out to do? My answer, my answer is I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Um, I don't know. I don't. I think you could make a real argument. It, it may not. May me hasn't done what it's hoped in Europe. But what do you consider good results in China? I don't know how you measure it. I, I'd like to see packed packed buildings. And you know, I think there were questions about that. With everybody, how many of them with, were they with papered? Everybody and, buying tickets. Well, the thing is, like. If you get 1% of the people in China who like hockey, it's a victory, right? Sure. But here's my question is, how long does it take? You know, the the guys from the United States who won the World Cup of Hockey in 1996, they all talked about the Miracle on Ice in 1980. Yeah. Now, for the first time, less than 50% of the league is Canadian. And you're, you, you can make a real argument that your footprint across the USA, including the Sun Belt, which we all mocked for a long time, is working. How long did that take? At least a generation. So, Because you know what? You need to have one of your own get there. So uh, Exactly. So I think in, the, in Europe right now, like someone said to me there's four players from Slovakia in the NHL this year. I think you have to worry about that. Like you have to worry about that. But if you're asking about China and you're saying, what's a success? We might not know for 20 years. Because mm-hmm. until you get one of the athletes in, how did basketball do it? And is it just, oh, the Yao Ming effect? Well, there's that, but it's also basketball is a more, is, is like, that's the one thing. It's more international in the sense that the thing about hockey is it's still tough to play. It's expensive. You know, why is soccer so popular worldwide? Everybody can play. Everybody can do it. Basketball, same thing. Everybody can do it. Hockey's harder. And we have this problem in North America right now about how, you know, if you're if you're not from a wealthy family, you don't have a wealthy background, how can you play? So yeah. I, I think it takes, it's, it's going to take at least a generation to figure out if this is going to work. This is an interesting one. I can only think of a couple off the top of my head. Jeff Daniels. Um, guys, you seen any players at a high level of hockey, pro, college, CHL, 
Attempt to learn to play right and left-handed. New day and age. I don't think it's crazy to think that we'll see it someday in the future. Gordie Howe is the most famous. I remember remember going to an old-timer game and watching Norm Ullman play with that two, two-sided stick. I played on a line in an old-timers game, like in a charity game once. I was with uh, Norm Ullman and Ron Ellis. Did I felt, have the, I felt like the Paul stick? Henderson. Did he have the stick that could uh, go both ways? I didn't notice. The most, the most thing I noticed about Norm Ullman was how many cigarettes he could smoke in the dressing room after. Maybe we should have that him was on the, the smoking show then. Have him on the stuff, Norm on the smoking show. I saw Chris Chelios flip it over once and score in a game against Montreal when he was in Chicago. I know Chelios can do it. Yeah, he, he I, like it wouldn't surprise me. Like, why couldn't you do it? Like in baseball, we've seen pitchers who can throw left and right. Yeah, left and right. I have no doubt that some of these guys can do it. But the first time I remember seeing it was I went to a charity game and Norm Ullman took the opening face off, and he had his stick to turn one way, and then he flipped it over and he had a blade on the other side awesome. and and took the face off the other way. Did I have a smoke. And, and the guy who was taking the draw against him had no idea what to do. But with the skill of these guys now, for sure, it's going to happen. Uh, at uh, Purple People 80, Vikings fan or Mitch Hedberg fan. Some people got that. Dr. Demento. Would losing, I still love Dr. Demento Sunday nights. You would. Jim, I love Dr. Demento. You would. Uh, would doing something like awarding draft position based on most team goals scored by non-playoff teams, incentivize coaches to coach to score over coach to win. Good idea, bad idea. People discuss. talk about this all the time. Yes, they do. Um, hey, uh, you want to come up with ideas and models, I'm always willing to hear them. Yeah. I can't see it changing too much from the current format. Clem Fandango, do you think, we'll end on this one, do you think the New York Rangers will wait until closer to the deadline to start moving players, or could players like Zuccarello, Hayes, etc., be moved sooner than later. I think there are teams trying now for Hayes. Um, you know, Nick mentioned on Saturday night that Winnipeg could be a fit. Um, I think there are teams that are going to try for Hayes. I think the, it, the ball is totally in the Rangers' court. When do they want to do it? You know, that was a heck of a win in San Jose the other night. They had every excuse to blow that game in overtime yes. when the Sharks hurdle scored with, what, 1.3 seconds remaining in regulation, and they won. It, that is going to be totally up to Jeff Gordon. I, I think he could move Hayes at any time. He could probably, if he wanted to, say if uh, he wanted to trade Zuccarello, he could move him at any time. There's going to be interest in those guys. It, it just comes down to when they decide they want to go through with it. Shattenkirk? Shattenkirk will be harder because he's got term. Yep. But it's not ridiculous term. Like He only signed for, what, four years? So there's only three years left, but I, I think that's going to be harder. But those two are both UFAs, and they'll have no trouble moving those guys. It really looks like, though, they've made the decision they're not going to sign Hayes, though. Yep. So, I mean, any time. Rangers going all in on the rebuild. Yes. For now, or all in on the rebuild, uh, it'll period? It'll be this summer. Like, we talked about you know who's Panarin. Up. Yeah, yeah that's and, the guy. And everybody says he's going to be a New Yorker, so we'll see. But, I mean, if the idea is get good players... When you're rebuilding, yeah, nothing wrong getting good there's players. a good player. Uh, on that, we'll wrap up. Thanks to our producer, Emil Delich. Thanks to Jason Spezza and the Dallas Stars organization uh, for making him available to the podcast. And thanks to YouTube for making me shave today. And wear a collared and, shirt. And wear good clothes. And drag a comb through your hair. <laughs> so thank you, YouTube guys. 31 Thoughts, the podcast returns next week.